for the word of prayer. So, dear Father, we thank you uh, for this day. I thank you for these students. Thank you for their, all their hard work on the second homework. Let's pray that you'd uh, help us to understand the material we go over today and just help these students to uh, prepare for the test, which is upcoming next week. Just we uh, pray that you be glorified in what we do here this day, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. So uh, if you haven't turned your homework in already, I hope you're close to doing it. There's a stack of it up here. So, um, well, there's one I know that I should look at. The rest of it, and then once I've shown you that solution, then I'll ask if you have questions about any other ones. Obviously, one, uh, problem 17, part C, is the one we've been working on for a while in these days. Let's see here. So, of course, A and B are easy enough to do. I got lots of stuff like that in the notes if you look. Assumably, you've read the notes by now. I hope you're reading my notes. If you're not reading my notes, you're making this class a lot harder than it needs to be. <laughs> like, if you're just reading the book and not reading my notes, you're not approaching my class the right way. I told you, read my notes. I tell you in the homework, read my notes. By this, I mean read my notes. So, just to be clear, read my notes. I think we've established that you should read my notes. All right, I'm going to shut up. So this one, x plus y plus z equals 12, I'm trying to put a circle there. So basically the idea, um, I think, is the easiest way to think about it conceptually. is just you want to take a, basically a piece of paper, let's say the UV paper, and just paste it up here. And to do such, it effectively amounts to mapping the unit vector in the u direction and the unit vector in the v direction to a pair of orthonormal vectors on the plane. It doesn't really matter which ones, I just need to find a pair of orthonormal vectors because you know, it doesn't matter which way the circle is situated, right? Your freedom, I mean, you, got a lot of, you have a rotational freedom in setting up the coordinates over there. Since it's a circle we're interested in, the situation of the curve doesn't really matter. Um, so I find a vector A and B, which are orthonormal, as I described to you in the last class. Um, I th almost used the ones you guys suggested to me. I ended up using one, zero, minus one. And then if I take A cross the normal, that gives me this 1 minus 2, 1. Normalizing that, this has length 6. So 1 over the square root of, I mean, 1 is the square root of 6. So 1 over the square root of 6 is a unit vector. That gives me unit vectors A and B. And um, so that allows me to define this, this mapping from, from UV space to the plane. 3, 4, 5 is my, the center of the circle. And then this basically sets up a UV coordinate system on the plane based at the center of the circle. And then all I do is I take a circle of radius 7 in the UV plane, which is easy to write down, right? 7 cosine theta, 7 sine theta. I know this parameterizes a circle of radius 7 centered at the origin. That's the basic stuff that you really should know from last semester even, when you talked about parameterized curves in the plane. Um, and then just feed it into my t-map. And that should do what I want if I understand the geometry correctly here. And so there it is in all its glory, the parameterization of the circle in the x plus y plus z equals 12 plane of radius 7 centered at 3, 4, 5. It's this. As I said, sines and cosines, but numbers you wouldn't guess. At least I wouldn't guess them. Like if you asked me, just write the answer down without showing work. Uh, not in my skill set. <laughs> and since I don't trust it, I check my answer. Uh, and so to check the answer, I have to look at x minus 3, y minus 4, z minus 5. This is the, uh, the vector from the center point, 3, 4, 5, to x, y, z in my parameterization, I ought to be able to see a couple things. First of all, I should be able to see that this is on the plane, right? Which means that x plus y plus z is actually equal to 12. If you add these param parametric formulas up, the sines and cosines cancel through a, you know, the sines and cosines end up canceling, and you just get 3 plus 4 plus 5, which is 12. That's good. It's on the plane. And then to see that it's actually um, on the sphere of radius 7, whose intersection with the plane is clearly the circle we're interested in, you can calculate the length of this vector, which ends up being this thing. And then 
this, this vector x has, in fact, ha is a unit vector, which is to say that the difference between x, y, z, and 3, 4, 5 has length 7, that vector, which is to say that it's on the sphere of radius 7 centered at 3, 4, 5. In other words, my parameterization is correct. I think this is simpler than the one we were getting with the modified spherical coordinates, although I do like the modified spherical coordinate solution. The one I like the least is the Cartesian one we started with that involved the solution of the quadratic. It was kind of like brute force, but not particularly elegant, and it gave us awful formulas. If we actually had to do something with this curve, these formulas are pretty nice to work with for our later purposes. Any, any questions? I know I've got that out of my system. X and Y equal to what? X is R cos theta. R cos theta. And then you solve for Z to get 12 minus X minus Y. That would definitely put you on the plane, but I wonder if it is putting you on the circle. Okay. I have a suspicion that your parameterization is not actually on the circle. Could be. I mean, you'll have X squared plus Y squared is equal to 7. But then you also have to add the z squared term to get the distance from the center point. Right. Well, it should be plus five. I, I don't. I don't. I don't think it's a circle. <coughs> no, no, no. I, I mean, I want to. I, I want to believe, but I'd have to look at your solution. Okay. There, there may be other ways. Yes, sir. Oh, you did what he's saying, and you got an ellipse. Ah. Uh, I did something like that in the notes, and I got an ellipse where I was sort of, I was expecting a circle, and I was kind of disappointed I got an ellipse. I was like, oh, man. But I realize now that you have to do something like this t-map that preserves distances. If you want to take circles to circles, you need something called an isometry, something that preserves the distance function. Name. You said, you said, like, find a parameterization of something and then name it. Oh, what is it? Can anybody tell them what it is? It was a line. Yes, that was uh, oh. a really, st really stupid formulas for a line, problem 25, yes. Um, let's see here. So here's that one, problem 25. The, um, the arc length is 3t cubed. So if you go back and look at, you just got x is equal to 2 thirds s, y is equal to, I think, 2 thirds s, or I don't know, yeah, 2 thirds s, and then and z, <laughs> z is equal to, to 1 third s, which of course is a line with direction vector 2 thirds, 2 thirds, 1 third that goes through the origin. So it's just a line with a really weird parameterization. Yeah. Other questions? Or comments? Yeah. I'll take comments. Oh. This is what I wanted. I said, find the arc length function, which is what I did. And then I said, name this curve and find its parameterization with respect to arc length. No, this, this is the, down here, this is the parameterization with respect to arc length for the curve. I've rewritten it in terms of arc length. Basically, I solve, re re eliminate t and replace it with s. That's parameterizing with respect to arc length. So I think I did, I think I did what I asked to do. Other questions? Unless I'm not, un maybe I'm not understanding you. I, I don't know. Well, I put three t cubed in for for t and r t. So yeah, it's for t and then it's for t and then. 
That, that is another parameterization of the curve, but I don't believe that's with respect to arc length. It, it, the error you're making is it's the, you're, you're being backwards in your thinking about how to find the arc length parameterization. It's just it's the opposite of what you're doing. So by doing that, you got further away from the arc length parameterization. For example, the helix. Um, right, this has speed. Um, right, so if I want to, if I want to abuse notation here for a second, what this means is really. Or perhaps I should say. I mean, this question is the notation. Well, anyway, getting to the point, the answer would be r cosine of t, not t, s, divided by the square root of r squared plus m squared, r sine of s divided by the square root of r squared plus m squared, um, m s divided by the square root of r squared plus m squared, because if that's the speed, that says the relation between arc length, the speed is constant, then that means that the arc length is just speed times time. In other words, um, time times the square root of r squared plus m squared, right? So if I solve this for t, I get t is equal to s divided by the square root of r squared plus m squared. So the way to parameterize, to find the arc length parameterization of the helix, is simply to solve the arc length function for time and then plug that, whatever that is, every place you've got time, and that gives you the arc length parameterization. Yeah, yeah. But it is a subtle thing, I mean, and there may have been an equation somewhere I wrote which misled you. It's very possible. Yeah. If so, I'm sorry about that. So what was the uh, what was the next question? <laughs> oh, of course. Not yet, but <laughs> soon, yes. Assuming Blackboard doesn't go down for the weekend, which would be annoying, but possible. You should save my notes somewhere on your computer. <laughs> yes. If speed is the magnitude of the velocity, yeah. yeah. Because it's minus parentheses sine squared, and that gives you sine squared plus cosine squared, which is one, and it collapses down to r squared. I agree with you. It's just the step I didn't write here. But the only reason I know this is because we did that helix example, and I've done it <sighs> many times. Other questions? I think the genin's fine, actually, if I remember right. How? That is actually problem. 63. By the way, the way I solve this torsion, the way I solve the torsion problem here in uh, problem 60 of the, of the posted problems, it's by no means efficient. There's a much simpler argument for that problem. But anyway, I'm digressing. It's not that bad, actually. All right, come on. Where'd you go? There we go, yes. So basically, you have <coughs> the one has, you know, parameterization minus 10 plus t, the other one has 20. Uh, one, one, one plus t, the other one has 20 minus 4t. 
So to see if there's any intersection point at all, I just use different variables and see if I can simultaneously solve these, right? And so I end up, when I do the algebra here, I'm just getting that tau is equal to 5. And if, if tau is equal to 5, and uh, if I scroll down here for a second, we'll find that t has to be equal to 10. Now tau is the time for the jonin, but t is equal to time for the genin. In other words, the elite, the elite ninja gets to the intersection point at time 10, but the novice ninja gets there at time 5. And so, oh wait a minute, other way around. <laughs> the, the elite gets there before the novice, so he, he already crosses the point. He never, he never picks up on the trail of the other one. Is, is the answer, so he, the, 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 uh, the slower one is, is, is fine. He survives. I thought he, could smell him from he lives another day. No, there's, there's no, I, I did not allow for atemporal smelling. So it's uh, right, yeah. Sorry. Other questions? <laughs> Um, I should say a word about problem 22. Um, you know, I might add instructions like calculate the derivative of this cross product. No need to simplify your answer. If I was to say that, for example, if that was a test question, that would mean that you don't actually have to take the cross products, right? <clears throat> now, I mean, technically, the way this question is written, it would have been totally valid to stop there, if you think about it, right? So I did actually calculate these cross products and simplify junk for the sake of the grader being able to read your answer, but I didn't say that you had to take the cross products. I mean, the calculus is done once you differentiate. So, nevertheless, this is the answer in all of its monstros monstros monstrosity that I got anyway. <coughs> Yes? For 30? Let's see here. But um, I got that from differentiating the speed. You guys have pointed out that I could do that because a sub t is, after all, dv dt. Or I could take a and dot with t, whichever. Should give me the same formula. Anybody else get that? OK, good. Whew. I was kind of tired when I wrote this. Just checking. <laughs> if you guys got the same wrong answer, then you know that would be unlucky for me. And a sub n is not, I, there may be a way to simplify a sub n, I don't know. This is the simplest formula I came to, but I mean, you can make like a common denominator, maybe some stuff cancels, I don't know. It's possible. I got tired of it at this point, though. And like I told you, since I said verify, I, I, I removed the verify, I'm just content to leave my answer plus or minus. This is not the best answer. Like, the best answer removes the plus or minus. It tells you which is plus or which is minus. You know, and, and actually working out the verification would settle that, but it would also be about two pages of calculus. So I'm being lazy, sorry. Yes, sir. Oh. Well, it goes back to this little calculation. The velocity, right, is the speed times the unit tangent. So dv dt is equal to dv dt times t plus v times d big T dt, right? But that is, you know, dv dt times t plus kappa, um, kappa v v with v squared um, n by the fresnais ray non-unit speed equation. So you can identify that that's a sub t and this is a sub n. Of course, you can also calculate a sub t by a dot t. That's the other way, as I did in class. 
But as was pointed out to me at the end of my class example, couldn't you just differentiate speed? I said, that's a good idea. I'm going to do that in the homework. So I did. Well, yes, but then you'd still have to uh, find the length of that vector to get the a sub n. But yeah, you can do that. Other questions? So yes, I will, will of course, of course uh, post this on the Blackboard. Let's look at the website here for just a minute, if you don't mind. So what did Mission 1 look like last year? You know, if you look at this Mission 1 from last year, these are all good problems, right? So, I mean, the one thing I emphasized last year that I have not emphasized enough this year is the idea of the, um, this here problem, do, 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 where was that thing? Sorry, I should have told you to get some. Ah, where'd that thing go? Problem four is always challenging to students. Suppose a tetrahedron is formed by joining four <coughs> equilateral triangles of same length one. If the base face of the tetrahedron is on the xy plane and one vertex is at the origin, and another one's at one zero zero, find the coordinates of the remaining vertices. Could you do that? <coughs> if you're studying this weekend, you might try your hand at some of these problems. The solutions are here. Uh, another good one is, what's the, what's the volume? Do you guys know how to find the volume of a parallel pipehead? It's something you should have come across in the reading, and I really should have said in class. I don't know if I did. So all is not lost. I'll say it today. I mean, I think I did, but I, I, I don't think I've emphasized it enough. If I have a parallelogram like this, so here's A. Here's B, right? And then I you know, make it into a parallel pipette. Let's say C, C, right? So this is some kind of, I, I can't draw it worth anything. <laughs> it's awful. <laughs> I'm trying to draw perspective here, but I'm, I'm failing. You know what, here, let me make it easier. Ding, 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 ding. So if I did this, then everybody's pretty good with finding the volume, right? Here. So if this is A, if this is B back there, if this is C, then that forms a right-handed triple because A crossed into B goes in the C direction, right? So you could say A, B, C is right-handed, right-handed triple. All right, that means that the cross product of the first two is in the general direction of the third one. Um, well, more, more technically, if, if A and B are, are the, the stricter use of the term is that A cross B is collinear, with, is, is actually parallel with C. That, that, that's more often what I mean when I say right-handed. But if you loosen it up, you just say it's in the same general direction. Okay, um, anyway, what's the volume of such a, you know, such a, such a box? Or if you, if you allowed the box to kind of get smushed, so this, these weren't right angles. You'd have a parallel pipette. What's the volume of it? What you do is you do A dot B cross B. It's the so-called triple product. The significance of the triple product is it gives you the volume of a box that has A and B and C as, as sides. 
the sign of that triple product has to do with whether or not ABC is a right-handed triple. If ABC is a right-handed triple, I don't need to do anything else. The formula is correct, all right? But because A, B, and C might be a left-handed, if they, they might not be lined up right, this could be a negative in general, so you have to put an absolute value just to be safe. Because if your, if your triple of vectors is not right-handed, that, that triple product could end up being negative. And of course, the volume is positive. So that's another important application of dot and cross products I should have told you something about. I don't think I assigned a homework problem, which is unfortunate, because this is something I might ask on the test. Right? Problem nine? Ah, there it is. I was looking for that, and I couldn't see it. <laughs> I was looking for that problem. I'm reading the problem, and I'm somehow skipping over this. <laughs> ah, idiot. Um, oh, I will. But before I forget, this is equal to the absolute value of the determinant if you just take the vectors and you just shove them into a big 3 by 3 matrix. So that the triple product is related to the determinant of just, you take all three vectors and just shove them in a box, take the determinant, that's a triple product. Because the determinant also tells you the volume. Determinants are connected to volumes. Generally speaking, determinants in of an n by n matrix gives you the n volume. But yes, I will look at that problem. Here we go. Come on. That's another problem I often ask on tests. Here's three points. Find the angles. Find the, you know, the angles at the points that are formed by this triangle. Three points, you know. But it's, it's, it's just very simple, really. You have these three sides, right? And so the, the volume is just the determinant of you just put all three of them in a box, take the determinant with the usual formula. The difference here is instead of having, the determinant we've been doing has had the x hat, y hat, z hat, because we've been calculating a cross product from a determinant pattern. This is an honest to goodness determinant. The answer is a number. So you just, it's the same rule though. You see that? <coughs> One times. The uh, must be somebody walking on the roof again, huh? Do you guys understand where this is coming from? So I have one, is that one, and then there's no, there's no y term, so that there's no the middle term, but then there's this one, which is that one. So the first one, you have two times one, which is two, minus two times zero, which is zero. The second one, you look at this submatrix, you have two times zero, minus two times zero, which is zero, so you just end up with two. Of course, you can also calculate, you can also calculate the cross product of B and C and take the dot product, but I think, I think it's honestly easier to take the determinant of the three vectors put in a box. That's like, this is the more computationally easy way to do it. I would do it that way if I was asked to on, a, on a, something with time pressure. Anyway, I would just encourage you to look back through last year's homework. There's lots of good problems in there, you know. The solutions are there. So as I make the test, I'll look at your homework, I'll look at last year's homework, I'll look at the problems that you were, that I suggested you look at the book. I'll think about what I said in class. That's how I make my test. And of course, I also look at last year's tests because I'm lazy. Um, well, but last year I had given quizzes because I was a glutton for punishment. Um, so there's quizzes, you can try those, there's blank ones posted, you can take your mind out on a test drive, see how it does, you know? Indeed. It's all there. Not a thing isn't, I don't, these are not in Blackboard obviously, right? So. Here is test one. Find a non-zero vector which is orthogonal to both x hat and y hat plus z hat. What's that? How do you read that problem? <coughs> Cross product, right? If 
somebody gives you two vectors and say, I want one perpendicular to both, you should immediately go to, that's the cross product. That's what that's for. That's what we built it for. Magnitude standard angle, you know, geometric problem. Anyway, it's all there. I'll let you look at it. Um, this, the, the length of this test is representative. Usually, a class like this, I'll have about 15 problems, Tuesday, Thursday test, something like that. If you don't know what you're doing, time will be an issue. If you know what you're doing, you should be fine. Anyway, for that, have a good weekend. And thank you for